Well, happy Sabbath to all of you. Hopefully uh, the technology is working. It, uh, as was mentioned in the opening prayer, uh, what a blessing it is that we have this technology that we can communicate with each other from halfway across the world. And so it's really good uh, to see all of you. I want to bring greetings uh, from your brothers and sisters here in the United States to those of you in Sri Lanka and also in India and, uh, and Pakistan, Bangladesh, and others that are there in, in South Asia. You know, we had a beautiful sunset here in the U.S. here on Friday night. And uh, while the world at large really is suffering in many regards, we, we see so many things that are happening you know, with political unrest in nations, the ignoring of God in homes, schools, and governments. And yet we see in God's creation often the peace and harmony that love and the love that God intended for all of us to have. He created this earth for us to live and to grow and to learn and how to walk according to his laws, to submit to his government and to his biblical way of life, his biblical truths in order to be first fruits in his kingdom. And that is our ultimate destiny uh, that every day we need to keep in the forefront of our minds, lest we allow the cares of this life to distract us and to lose sight of that goal. So I want everyone of you there that is listening uh, to be diligent, to hold fast, and to be part of that wedding supper and invited to dine with our older brother, Jesus Christ. So God speed that day. Well, I'd like you to think about, uh, as we begin the sermon today, I, I'd like to ask you a question. And if you've got something to write down with, if you're taking notes or you have an iPad or you have a notepad, the question is, what are three word phrases that you can think of, three word phrases that you can think of that are the hardest to express to another person? Again, what are two, three word phrases that you can think of that are truly meant, but are most difficult to express to another person? Now, I know the wheels may be turning, and I'm sure that there may be a lot of different answers, a variety of answers. There may be answers such as, I was wrong. Okay, that can be a tough one to say, isn't it? Or, it's my fault. Now, those are certainly tough and difficult to say, but the top reoccurring three-word phrases that are the most difficult to express to another person are, I am sorry, and I forgive you. Those are the two top, most difficult three-word phrases to say. Now, nearly every parent knows how difficult it is to teach their children to say, I am sorry, to another sibling, and the hurt sibling finds it just as difficult to say, or maybe even more so, but that's okay, or I am sorry, or I forgive you. And harder yet, I think, is to teach our children not only to say it, but to mean it. Now, remarkably, God the Father, in a similar way, is also working with children, his adults, sons, and daughters, and is teaching us what true forgiveness is. He is teaching us how to truly forgive others. Now, perhaps some of you wrote down on your notepad or on your notes a moment ago, maybe you wrote down the phrases, I am sorry, or I forgive you. And both of those are really hard. Now, why is that? Because our pride keeps us from admitting that we are wrong and saying, I'm sorry. And we are slow to forgive or grant forgiveness to those who have offended us. Choosing rather to hold on to and not forgive in order to have some kind of leverage against someone who we think has wronged us or hurt us or treated us unjustly and unkindly. Now, forgiveness is not a little thing in the Christian's life, nor is it a small dimension in our spiritual walk, but it's actually at the very heart of being a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, this matter of unforgiveness can be among the most damaging matters 
in our spiritual and our physical walk. Now, we are all in need of God's forgiveness, aren't we? But sometimes we are unwilling or unable to forgive others. Now, the scriptures, the Bible, has a lot to say about forgiveness, and that's the topic that we're going to discuss today. Now, as was mentioned already by Mr. Frank Reckerman, the title of my message is Forgive and You Will Be Forgiven. Forgive and You Will Be Forgiven. Now, when it comes to forgiveness, I think a bigger and more important question to ask ourselves is, what kind of forgiveness do I offer? What kind of forgiveness do I offer? And we're going to touch on that question today. And that's an important question to ask, especially as we rehearse the lessons of the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, which are the very first festivals in God's plan of salvation. There are seven annual festivals, the first one being the Passover. And when it comes to the Passover, we might say it's not only a festival of faith, but that it's also a festival of forgiveness, our forgiveness. We often examine ourselves prior to that festival. We are told to examine ourselves before we partake of the Passover. We are to look inward to see the shortcomings that are there, and then to ask for God's forgiveness prior to taking that Passover. So it's not only a festival of faith, but also a festival of forgiveness, our forgiveness. And we rehearsed that at that time in the spring. We rehearsed what God has done for us. Now, when we talk about Passover, it is a festival of forgiveness, a festival of redemption, a festival about reconciliation, and it's a festival about restoration. It's interesting that that is all at the beginning of God's plan. And it's the beginning of where God's mind is in dealing with us. And it's the end of where God's mind is. And it all surrounds the subject of forgiveness. And as we focused in the spring festivals on becoming a new unleavened lump before God, the Father and Jesus Christ, there's probably no greater assignment as a child of God than the assignment of the homework of forgiveness. And it's just not something involving the past or the present, but it's something that we're going to have to deal with in the future. At Passover, we rehearsed what God has done for us and the sacrifice and the complete sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us, the, the forgiveness that was there for us. Now, some may say, well, you know, I've really got no animosity toward anyone. I, I have no bitterness towards anyone. I have forgiven all individuals who have sinned against me a long time ago. And that's good. Some of you might be unsure. And you can't think of being in a situation that you needed to forgive someone. And that's good, too. But I suggest before our lifetime is over, we will all have to go through the assignment of forgiveness. So let's talk about this today, because there's some important truths and lessons that God wants to teach us. Because those who are unable to forgive are actually paralyzed by it. It affects us emotionally, it affects us physically, and it stymies our ability to grow spiritually. And there are long-term ramifications as to whether we will be in the kingdom of God if we do not forgive. Now let's understand something. Let's understand how important forgiveness is to God and what a forgiving God that we have. Let's begin by turning to Psalm chapter 86 and verse number five. Psalm chapter 86 and verse number five. And let's notice something here in Psalm 86, that as we begin to understand forgiveness, we begin to understand God. And in this context here of Psalm 86, it begins to describe what our God is like. And it talks about his character. And it talks about his character attributes. Let's begin here now in Psalm chapter 86 and verse 5. 
And it says this, it says, for you, Lord, are good. Now, you and I may already agree that God is good, but why is God good? Well, let's continue to read. For you, Lord, are good and notice and ready to forgive. Notice that our God is ready to forgive. That's part of his nature. That's one of his characteristics. And that is what he ultimately wishes. Let's continue here. It says, and you are abundant in mercy to all of those who call upon you. God is ready. God is ready to forgive. And if we look at that Hebrew word that is translated into the English word ready, it can also be translated prepared. It can mean in a sense or be translated in a sense that God is prepared to forgive. That's his proclivity. That's his natural spiritual state, that he desires to forgive all who have sinned. But God not only speaks about forgiveness in the scriptures, as he does here in Psalm chapter 86, but he goes further and he shows us how to do it. Let's notice something in Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34. Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34. Now in Luke chapter 23, we have God in the flesh. And we see the reality of this character trait in action. But before we begin reading here, let's set the stage just a little bit. You know, as we sometimes bring out at Passover time, we rehearse the complete sacrifice that Jesus gave on our behalf. And not only in his death, which was for our sins, but also in his painful suffering, which was for our healing. That, too, was a part of his complete sacrifice. Now, to set the stage here for the context for this verse that we're about to read, at this point, Jesus has endured remarkable circumstances. There has been an illegal trial. There has been an illegal sentencing. He has been rushed from hall to hall, from palace to palace. He's been placed in front of one false accuser after another. We know that he had a crown of thorns that was stamped upon his head. We know that he had been flagellated on his back, on his sides, on his legs with rods and whips. There had been a cat of nine tails, which is a whip with strings of bone and metal that had lacerated his body and his skin and tore flesh from off of his body. He had been mocked. He had been disrespected. He had been falsely accused. He had been spit upon. And now his body is nailed to a piece of wood. And it is in this context that Jesus says the following here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This was one of the last things that Jesus said on his earthly ministry as he was nailed to a wooden stake dying. Father, forgive them. Now, how does this correspond with Psalm chapter 86, which we just read? Remember it said, God is good. And then it goes on to say why, because he is ready. He is prepared. He is looking for an opportunity to forgive. And we see a remarkable example here of this, of our Messiah, of our Savior, of an older brother, our older brother, who did no wrong, and yet he sets this remarkable example of love and forgiveness as he dies a criminal's death. Now, with this as a background, and having looked at Psalm chapter 86 and verse 5, and also having looked here at Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34, let's add one more verse to lay a foundation of what we might say is a very important biblical imperative. That God is not asking you and I to do something that he isn't willing to do while he walked on this earth as a human being. I'll say that again. 
God is not asking you and I to do something that his own son wasn't willing to do while he walked on this earth as a human being. Let's turn over together to Psalm chapter 103. Psalm chapter 103, and let's take a moment to remember, and this certainly fits in with the meaning of the Feast of the Passover. Let's take a moment to remember what God has done for us. He has been there for you and for me, and how he was ready to forgive. Let's pick it up right here in verse number one of Psalm chapter 103. Psalm chapter 103 and verse number one. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. What are some of his benefits to you and me? Let's notice verse three, who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals all of your diseases. Verse four, who redeems. Now, redeems, what does that mean? It means to buy back or to recover, to buy back or to recover our life from destruction. And notice he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, just a thought, and there's certainly a tie into the parable of the story of the prodigal son, how the father accepts his prodigal son back, clothing him with a robe and with shoes, and not only redeeming him, but reconciling him and restoring him, in a sense, to the station in which he had become, again, as his son. Verse number five, let's continue to read on here now, with Psalm chapter 103 and verse number five. It says, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Forgiveness, it empowers, it renews, it restores, it invigorates, it builds up. Let's continue to read in verse number six. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And notice verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and notice abounding in mercy. Let's drop down to verse number 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Now, we've all sinned, haven't we? We've fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 10 continues, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities, which we can be very grateful for. And now verse number 12, let's drop down to verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Unbelievable. An unbelievable promise from God how he forgives and removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And we rejoice in that fact each Passover as we remember the baptismal, baptismal covenant that we have made and are humbled, brethren, by the insurmountable price, the insurmountable debt, the cost that Christ paid for our sins and his willingness to completely forgive. When we consider this kind of godly forgiveness towards others, it is something that we should keep in a constant state of mind that it begins to become part of our nature as well, just as it is a part of God's nature. For those of us that have gone under the waters of baptism, we become buried and forgiven. Do you remember? Do you remember how you felt when you came out of the waters of baptism that you were completely clean? washed from your sins, and forgiven. You know, if we remind ourselves of this, maybe that would change our outlook on others. To remind ourselves of being in that baptismal pool and, and what it was like to be forgiven. What it was like to be clean, to be redeemed, to be restored. 
with an identity and a dignity, redemption, restoration, and reconciliation. As we rehearse the Passover, I think there are a few essential realities that God desires to teach us through that festival and through forgiveness. One of the things, number one, is we were reminded as Christians that we have our own imperfections, don't we? As we strive to emulate a perfect God. Even after baptism, even after the Passover, we sin, don't we? And we will be at fault. And we will make mistakes, either unwittingly or otherwise, towards other people. And yet, God is there for us. Despite our weaknesses, he is ready to forgive. And because he forgives us, we should forgive others. And this is the area I want to begin to focus on in the rest of the message here. Because we have been forgiven, and we renew that forgiveness and that covenant at, at baptism at, at, during the Passover, because we have been forgiven, we must forgive. And that's hard. And we're going to talk about why that is in just a moment. We see the example of Jesus Christ, who has changed all of our lives with his forgiveness. And as does his disciples, then we are to imitate that. We are to follow that example. You know, as a pastor, I've seen some real family challenges, even in my own family. And I've listened to challenges within the church family. I've listened to some terrible stories and situations in members' personal lives where I've been told he did this or she did that, or he didn't pay back what he owed, or she said this about me, or her words were cruel or mean, or I was falsely accused by him, or he lied, or she's been a tale bearer. And long after the circumstances have ended, and there's really nothing that can be done, persons are holding on to the complaint or the hurt or the injustice and the feud that should have long since ended continues. And sadly, these individuals never let go of the circumstances. They become bitter and annoyed and are unwilling or unable to resolve the matter, unable to reconcile or to forgive. And they are chained and enslaved. You know, if you find yourself in an unforgiving relationship, you are actually chained and enslaved. God's people are called to a higher calling, a higher calling of forgiveness. We have received forgiveness from God, and we have our marching orders to follow the example of Jesus Christ and to follow his teaching on this topic. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 21. Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 21. And let's notice and listen to these instructions that come straight from Jesus Christ. Now, Peter asked Jesus a question on the matter of forgiveness. So this is very much connected with the topic today. He asks a question on the matter of forgiveness in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 18. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Up to seven times. You know, Peter probably thought that was a good question. And it is a good question. But I wonder, in a way, if Peter maybe wanted a little bit of a pat on the back. As you know, Peter often spoke up and said what was on his mind, and sometimes without thinking it through. And perhaps Peter was thinking about forgiveness and knowing that it's good to, to give a person maybe three chances, you know, three strikes and then you're out. Perhaps Peter was thinking, well, we should go over and beyond that. Maybe seven is a good number. That's a complete number, seven. Well, let's read on verse number 22. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. 70 times seven. You know, one thing many people don't know about Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher, is that he had several teaching styles, and one of those was exaggeration. Exaggeration for effect. 
Like if your right hand causes you to sin, well, cut it off. Well, he wasn't, he was really literally telling people to do that, but he was exaggerating for effect and it was telling an analogy here. Here Christ is telling Peter, it's not about a calculation, but it's about a matter of the heart. Are you and I only to forgive our spouse, our children, a family member, our brethren, a stranger, on a calculation? On a calculation that they have just reached your limit of forgiveness. No, it's based on love. Jesus as says basically, just as Jesus says, as I have forgiven you, you forgive others. And it's not based on the number of sins that are committed against us. Jesus then goes on in this context here, he goes on to give a wonderful parable, which follows Peter's question of forgiveness. And it's given in this context of forgiveness. So Jesus begins to teach here in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 23. He's not done talking about forgiveness. In verses 23 here through 25, he begins to talk about a servant who owes an insurmountable debt that there is no way that he can ever pay, ever. You know, let's read here in verse number 24. It says, and when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I talked about Jesus being an exaggerator in teaching. Let's talk about this amount of 10,000 talents. How much are, money are we talking about? You know, I think that really helps to understand if we know how much 10,000 talents is in today's money. Do you know? How much 10,000 talents is today in today's money? It is 3.4 billion U.S. dollars. 3.48 billion U.S. dollars. And this man, he throws himself at the mercy of his master. This is an insurmountable debt that he will never ever be able to pay he throws himself at the mercy of the master to whom he owes his debt let's pick it up here in verse number 26 the servant falls down before his master and he says have patience with me and i will pay you all and then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him that debt the master releases him. He's free. And he forgives him the entire insurmountable debt, totally free, totally forgiven. And then that forgiven servant, he goes out and finds a fellow servant who owes him money. Let's pick that up here in verse number 28. But that servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, let's understand how much a hundred denarii is. Well, in U.S. dollars, in today's money, that would be about 5,800 U.S. dollars. 5,800. As compared to 3.48 billion. That's a pretty small comparison between the two. He owed him a hundred denarii and he laid hands on him and he took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. Pay me what you owe, he says. And the man says, well, I can't pay you. And so the forgiven man, who's been forgiven 3.48 billion, lays hands on him, takes him by the throat. I guess he feels he won't get his money if he kills him. And so he puts him in jail, hoping he'll get his money at some point in the future. You know, in summary, despite the fact that the servant was forgiven an insurmountable debt, he demands from another, which proportionally owes him a very few amount of dollars, he takes him and demands that he pay him. Can you imagine? Now, let's forget money for a moment. In Christ, we have been forgiven an insurmountable and an unpayable debt, haven't we? Isn't that the truth? So the question is, 
you and I have been, been forgiven of such an insurmountable and unpayable debt, are you going to threat? Are you going to lay hands on another for the offenses that they have done to you? Do you see what God is trying to teach us? And as we consider that, let's continue to read. Let's read verses 32 and verses 33. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? So that's the lesson here. The forgiven sinner, prompted by gratitude for the forgiveness received, must always, in every case, do everything in their power to forgive the one who offended them. Christ further teaches us the lessons of forgiveness here in Matthew chapter 6. So let's take a closer look here. Let's take a closer look at this familiar scripture known as the Lord's Prayer. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to pick it up here in verse number 9. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 9. Now, this is really an example prayer here. It's a pretty well-known section of scripture that's called the Lord's Prayer, really a model prayer, a sample prayer. But this example prayer was given by Jesus Christ when his disciples asked him the question, Lord, teach us how to pray. And it's a remarkable model prayer that covers a lot of important topics in just a very few short words. And as we'll see, forgiveness is one of those topics. So again, let's pick it up here in Matthew chapter 6 in verse number 9. In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, when we say our Father in heaven, we first of all acknowledge that we all have a common father, don't we? And secondly, we acknowledge that we are yielding ourselves to something that is higher and bigger than ourselves. We acknowledge and connect with someone that is bigger than ourselves. And why is this important? For several reasons. Because at times when it comes to forgiveness, when placed on our own shoulders, it's just too big for us. We don't have the capacity the capability, the ability of and by ourselves to totally forgive. It's not human to forgive, brother. It's not human to forget. We need God's help. This is a spiritual issue. So let's continue to read what Jesus teaches us with this example prayer. Verse number nine. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, whatever we ask, that it will be according to his will. And when Jesus says, may your will be done on earth as in heaven, regarding forgiveness, God would have us to recognize that one of the greatest aspects of demonstrated his will on earth as it is in heaven is a child of his on earth who is able to forgive another human being. Jesus prayed in this prayer to the Father, your will be done as it is in heaven. And notice verse number 12, and forgive us our debts, notice, as we forgive our debtors. Now, this isn't well understood. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others, our debtors. These two are connected. These two concepts are tied together. Now, this is a powerful verse. Think about what we are asking God. When we look at the sample prayer, we recognize a remarkable and profound reality. Simply put, our forgiveness from God to his children, you and me, is based proportionately and conditionally on our forgiveness to others. That's our assignment. That's our marching orders from Jesus Christ himself. Now, you might say, I can't do that. You don't know what happened to me. Now, God wouldn't ask you and I to do something that we couldn't do. He knows with the help of his Holy Spirit that we can. Now, why is this so important to forgive? 
But let's bring it down to a common denominator. Simply this, forgiveness from God to us is directly tied to our forgiveness to others. I'll say that again. Forgiveness from God to us is directly tied to our forgiveness to others. They are connected. They are bound together. You can't have one without the other. You can't have one if you don't do the other. It comes as an entire package. And so God's word clearly shows us. Now, it's not easy, but it is what we have been called to do. Now, I think there's a deeper meaning in this section of the model prayer. It's in our forgiveness of others' offenses that we reveal the fact that we have been forgiven. Did you catch what I said? It's in our forgiveness of other people's offenses against us that we reveal the fact that we have been forgiven by God. How do we reveal the fact that we've been forgiven? I think it's an only when we truly understand and have finally begun to comprehend the magnitude of what we have been forgiven of, of what the blood of Christ has done for us, that we then have the admonition to, in turn, forgive others. Brethren, if we remain in an unforgiving position, we actually call into question whether we understand our debt that Christ has forgiven us of and that God has forgiven us of. When we meditate on Christ's forgiveness to us, we begin to understand we begin to realize what we owe God is infinitely more than what any man or woman owes us or could ever owe us. And then we are able to let go of the debts to us. We do have a choice, though. We can choose to hold on to the debts that others owe us or to forgive as others or, or, we, or we can choose to forgive as we've been forgiven. It's our choice. We can hold on to debts that others hold against us, or we can choose to forgive as we have been forgiven. We have a choice. However, we're faced with a powerful voice of God saying that he's not going to forgive us unless we forgive others. Do we understand? Do we understand what God is trying to teach us? Do we understand what God is actually commanding us to do? Because in a sense, that's what he's doing. Now, God is a God of love. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he is calling us to show that same kind of love towards others. And if we desire to receive God's forgiveness, but we're unwilling to forgive others, then God cannot deal with us. And that's not how members of his family react. If we're not willing to forgive them, we stand in the way between an individual that God has called or will be calling one day. We stand in the way of being a great forgiver, of being a great reconciler. We stand in the way. We have to be able to forgive someone who's offended us regardless if they ever ask for forgiveness. Wow. Now, how do we know that's true? That we have to be able to forgive someone who's offended us regardless if they ever ask for forgiveness? How do we know that's true? Well, we've already read in Luke chapter 23, haven't we? Where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, they hadn't asked for forgiveness. Those who were surrounding him at that time while he was dying on a piece of wood, those who had mocked, spit on, falsely accused, disrespected, they had not asked for forgiveness. And yet we see Jesus' example to us of forgiveness for those that are offending him that had not even asked. I'll only refer for time to the example of Stephen in the book of Acts. You may remember this story in Acts chapter 7, 
and verse number 60. You can write that down in your notes if you like. Acts chapter 7, verse 60. For Jesus, or excuse me, Stephen was speaking, and the audience did not like what he was saying, and they ended up stoning him to death. But prior to his death, you remember what he said just before he died. He was talking to God, and he said, do not charge them with this sin. Do not charge them with his sin. He was able to forgive someone who was doing this to him, and they had not even asked for forgiveness. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 21. We've seen the examples of Christ. We've seen the example of Stephen. Let's see here what the Apostle Paul shares with us here in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 21. Let's read it together. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 21. Paul is writing, and he says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that's hard to do. It's hard to do, but God says to do good, even to our enemies. You know, it's been said, I don't know if you've heard this saying, but it's been said to return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. And to return good for evil is divine. I'll repeat that. It's been said to return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. But to return good for evil, that's divine. That's godly. So we have the Apostle Paul's example here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 20, 21. We have Jesus's and Stephen's examples as well. well. Let's notice one more example from Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. So let's turn over there to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 43. And you may notice here that this is part of Jesus's Sermon on the Mountain. This message of Jesus Christ that we find in Matthew chapter 5 is really at the core of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And part of the message here that Christ is talking about is doing good even to an enemy. Matthew chapter 5, and let's pick it up here in verse number 43. It says here that you may have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the common thought of that time in the first century. But let's continue to read on. But verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. And then he goes on to say how to love your enemies. And he talks about three ways to do this, to love your enemies. He says, first of all, bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. Second, do good to those who hate you. And thirdly, he says, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. He basically talks about three ways or three things to do in order to love your enemies. To bless those who curse you. To do good to those who hate you. And to pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Say good, do good, and pray for. When Jesus was surrounded by his enemies in the last few moments of his physical life, being nailed to a piece of wood, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. At this time, he was certainly following the teaching that he brought to us from the Father. Surrounded by his enemies, he was asking the Father for to, to forgive them. He was saying good, doing good, and praying for their forgiveness. That's his example. And why? Well, verse number 45, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, that's what sons and daughters of the Father in heaven do that you may be the sons of your father in heaven 
For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, you have no reward. Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Don't even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you, future sons, spiritual sons and daughters of God, you shall be perfect. Or as other translations say, complete. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, you may say, well, I know I need to do this. I know this is what being a disciple of Jesus Christ is about. I understand his example. I want to do that. But why is it that forgiving someone is so difficult? Why is it that it's so hard? Well, there are reasons why forgiveness in the human level and the human plane is difficult. Why? Why is it that way? Why is it so difficult? Well, one of the reasons is, is because the person who is hurt, the offended party, does the forgiving rather than the other way around. Did you catch that? The person who has been hurt, the person who has been offended, does the forgiving. Again, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult, because it's the offended party that does the forgiving, forgiving rather than the other way around. The person who forgives pays a tremendous price. The person pays the price of the evil that they forgive. The person pays the price of the evil that they forgive. Yes, forgiveness is costly. And it costs you, not the person being forgiven. Forgiveness can mean that justice will not always be fulfilled. Forgiveness does not necessarily restore the family member that has been taken by a drunk driver. Forgiveness does not restore the house that has been burned down because someone was carelessly playing with fire or playing with matches. Forgiveness does not restore the virginity to a rape victim. Forgiveness does not always restore or change the person who offended you or hurt you. But forgiveness is letting go. Forgiveness is letting go of the pain that you feel. You know, having been a minister now for, for over a decade, I've dealt with people who have a death grip with a person. Even sometimes after a person is no longer alive, a grandparent, a family member, a relative, a father, a mother, a step parent, a stepchild, a former friend, a stranger, they have a death grip that they can't let go, not realizing that that person has a life grip on them because they have not been able to let go. They have been unable to forgive. Now, that's not to excuse the behavior that was put upon them, and that's not to excuse the wrongs that were done to them, but they have not recognized that really the whole world has been dysfunctional since the beginning at the Garden of Eden, and that we've had 6,000 years of humanity drowning in our own human nature. Now, what I'm addressing is very difficult. There are people that have not let go. But that is the key to forgiveness, the letting go and letting God be the rectifier of the events in our life. Now, I heard a story that happened many years ago in my country at the end of the Civil War. You know, the North fighting the South over various things, including slavery. Students of U.S. history may recognize a commander of the Confederate Army by the name of Robert E. Lee. And he was commanding the Confederate Army in the South going against the Union Army in the North. Now, General Lee, after the war, was returning back to the state of Virginia, one of the states in my country. And he came to an old plantation and there was a woman that came out to meet him and a woman came out of what had been a beautiful mansion. As she approached this general, she said, General Lee, look what the Northerners have done. Look at what they did. And she pointed over to what had been a beautiful, majestic 
and spacious oak tree located the front entry of the plantation. Look at it, she said. It's a charred, burned ruin. Now she was expecting General Lee to agree with her and to fuel her level of hate and anger and unforgiveness. And the general looked at that tree and then he looked at the woman and then he said, Madam, cut it down. Cut it down and forget it. Now, perhaps some listening today, and it may not be a tree, but whatever it is that is keeping us from being a witness to God the Father and Jesus Christ, we need to cut it down and we need to forget it. And we need to give it over to God. Now, it's not easy to forgive. But let's consider the alternatives. What are the effects on us if we don't forgive? When we don't forgive, we become a slave to the past and we become a hostage to the present and we deny ourselves a future in the kingdom. But the good news is that God shares with us at the beginning of his plan of salvation that begins with the Passover, the first festival is that we know that Christ forgave us. He paid our insurmountable debt. You and I owed a debt that we couldn't pay. And Jesus Christ paid for us. He paid the price of all of our sins. And Christ paid it willingly and bared our debt. This understanding should change our perspective. The forgiven will be forgiven. The forgiven will also forgive. Knowing that our insurmountable debts are canceled and that we ourselves must cancel the debts that are owed to us. In other words, if we have experienced the assurance of forgiveness, we should be eager to forgive others who have committed offenses against us. We are to pass on the forgiveness that we have received. And finally, as scripture reveals, the unforgiving person will never enter into their destiny of eternal life, everlasting life with God. Remembering the instructions of what Jesus Christ himself said to us, as we read in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 14 and verse 15, he said, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Only those that forgive will be forgiven and enter into the eternity with God. So God shows the seriousness of this, doesn't he? And to meet this high challenge that we need to first draw close to God, we must respond to God's invitation when he says, come close to me and acknowledge the enormity of our debt, of our sins, we realize that we're bankrupt and we are totally at his mercy, an insurmountable debt. And in his mercy, he forgives it all. Wow. And as we totally embrace our debt and sacrifice that Jesus made for us, only then will we be able to be in the right posture to forgive others? Brother, we may need to fast and pray and ask for God's help and his Holy Spirit to help us forgive completely. We are to be known as his disciples. You know, if we love one another, and as we forgive one another, you show the person and the world who you are, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, who through forgiveness demonstrates the beautiful picture of Jesus Christ living in their own life, Christ in us. The apostle Peter further reminds us, and we'll conclude with this scripture today, over in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll read verses 9 and 10. Let's take a look at what Peter shares with us. The apostle Peter over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He says this, pretty familiar scripture, trying to tie it into the topic today. 
He says this, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. At one time you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, we are to mirror what Christ has done for us, showing mercy to others, not bringing up past offenses, but forgiving completely. And the chains that have held us down, that hurt, that anger, that resentment, that has tormented us for who knows how long, weeks, months, or even years, will drop off and we will truly be free. That is the blessing that you and I receive when we are able to say from our heart, sincerely, totally, and completely, I forgive you. And then, and only then, will we be forgiven and be ready for our destiny in the kingdom of God. For as we have learned from God's word today, forgive and you will be forgiven.